Okay, hello and welcome everybody. Today is Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. And welcome to another Wednesday webinar. And I'm glad everybody could join me today. So today, uh, <clears throat> because we've got a lot of questions and interest in our new biology clinic and curriculum, but mostly the new biology clinic, I thought I would go over sort of the history of how it came to be the philosophy of the clinic and some of the details about uh, what we're offering and what the, I guess you could say, the purpose of the clinic is. So that's what I'm going to do today. And I don't know if it'll take the whole hour, but we'll see where I get here. So obviously, I, <clears throat> I'm the uh, philosophical founder of the new biology clinic in other words while i wouldn't say that the clinic itself was my idea uh the 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 way we're doing medicine and the way the clinic is set up that's definitely a uh i don't know if you would say it's my idea but it really comes out of my entire career Going back, I started uh, doing medicine in 1985, so we're talking about 38 years. So this is sort of the culmination of a career in medicine. So how did this career in medicine come about, and how did it lead me to the philosophy and how you would be treated by the practitioners at the New Biology Clinic? That's essentially the question I'm going to try to answer today. Some of this may be rehashing things that you've heard, but at least it'll be in one place now. So I grew up in a fairly conventional middle-class sort of family. My father and grandfather were dentists and I did well in school. And somehow it was very clear to me that I was going to be a doctor a lot of my parents' friends were doctors, some even fairly famous doctors. I mean, not that famous, but like one was a gynecologist who uh, essentially invented lasers for the use in gynecology. So that's kind of famous for a doctor. Another uh, pioneered immunotherapy for cancer treatments Another was the head of oncology, hematology at uh, a major hospital in suburban and downtown Detroit, and so on. There was probably seven or 10 different doctors who were in my uh, family circle, not my direct family, but my parents' friend circle. So I was very familiar with doctors, grew up around doctors. My father and grandfather were dentists. And I basically didn't really want to have anything to do with it. I don't know what I what I was sensing, uh, but I didn't like to go to the doctor. And there's something about it that just did not make any sense to me. And I obviously couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, so I just kind of ignored the whole thing. <clears throat> and then I went off to college at Duke and was essentially very disappointed in the whole thing. And as a result of that, uh, what I thought was a very anti-intellectual environment, especially compared to my high school. Uh, and so I sort of wanted nothing to do with it. So I got out in three years just so I could get out. And then I had no idea what to do with myself. So I joined the Peace Corps and taught gardening in Southern Africa, actually Swaziland. And by some interesting quote coincidence, uh, while I was in Swaziland, I met the work of uh, Weston Price. I was given a book at a <clears throat> little workshop I went to, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And I was also given some books uh, by, or lecture series by Rudolf Steiner. And there I was uh, teaching gardening in a secondary school in Swaziland wondering what to do with myself after that was over. 
And so I started reading these books and it, it hit me then very clearly that the kind of doctor that I didn't want to be was not the only kind of doctor there was. I obviously at the time didn't know if these diet approaches or other approaches to medicine were correct. But I, what, what was relevant to me was I didn't know there was any other way to be a doctor. And so that was very clear to me. There was a diet way and there was a whole different kinds of medicine, homeopathy and herbs and different ways of looking at uh, what, why uh, people get sick and what might make them better. And that was a sort of like a light went off inside me. And I would say we're talking now late 70s, 1970s, pretty much from that day on, I would say pretty much every day since then, I've looked into some part of something to do with science, medicine, or biology. Probably not every day, but pretty much most days. Um so then it became clear that since uh, there was a different way to be a doctor, I, in fact, could go to medical school. And so came back and uh, applied and got into medical school. And the whole time I was in medical school, I knew I was going to be a different kind of doctor. I knew I was going to, like with college, I was going to get out of there as soon as I got my license, because I had the feeling like what I was learning there was had going to have little to do with the way I was going to practice medicine. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, and I, at that time, I was very into diet, and that's an understatement. I had actually was uh, studying macrobiotics. <clears throat> I went to Boston to study with Michio Kushi, and I knew a lot about uh, natural farming, uh, having taught gardening. I didn't know a lot, but I, I was looking into it and different ways of healing with food and uh, herbs and uh, plant extracts, things like that. The, the first thing I want to point out is that when I was in medical school, we had a class. This was Michigan State College of Human Medicine. And we had a class on how to interview. And uh, I wasn't by any means the top student in my class. I didn't really want to be or care to be, but I was the poster child for how to do an interview. And I had not been taught any of this, uh, but for some reason, when I was doing interviews on either mock patients or uh, then patients in the clinics or whatever, I developed a strategy of asking very detailed questions to my patients about how they lived. Now, in particular, it was about diet. And so people would come in, they could have a rash, they could have cancer, heart disease, didn't matter what they had. I would ask everybody, and this was unusual at the time, even for a kind of, quote, holistically minded medical school, which was basically a joke. Um, but I would ask them, so what do you eat and what do you, uh, how do you live? It seemed to me that if I was going to uh, help them, I needed to know how they were living and how they were eating. I don't know why I decided to think like that, but it seemed to be only reasonable for me. And so I, people would say things like, well, I have a good diet. And I remember thinking to myself, I'll be the judge of that. And so I learned how to ask questions, which was walk me through exactly what you eat in a day. Just like I could walk you through exactly what I ate for breakfast, even where the grains came from that I ground and made into bread and where the eggs and where the vegetables and where the miso came from and who made the soup broth and all these things. I can walk you through all that. And uh, what was interesting is most people didn't know what they ate, especially the men, but even women and uh, children, of course, didn't. Uh, and they couldn't really walk me through what they did, how they moved and what they thought about in a day. And so I would ask very specific questions. It was also interesting to me that when I started practicing, I would often hear uh 
because I, I at the time, in a way, believed that if somebody ate a really good diet, the perfect diet, what I was trying to do for myself, which is different than the, quote, perfect diet, I think now, but that they wouldn't be sick. So people came in and say, oh, I have a really good diet. And then when I was practicing, I would end up doing house calls. And one of the first things I would do is go and open their freezer and refrigerator and their cupboards. And to my shock, the people who said they had a really good diet, you know, three quarters of the things in their refrigerator or cupboards uh, were things that I would never eat. So all this taught me that the devil was in the details, or as I would put it now, the, the, the real information is in the story. And it's the story of a person's life, what, but in particular, what do they do and what do they think and how do they feel? And I learned to not accept uh, generalities like I have a good diet or I get a lot of exercise or... I have positive thoughts or whatever it is. Those don't mean anything. I want to know the brands and who made the food and, you know, what did you actually do for movement today? And so that's how I got started on this. And that continued into my practice. Eventually, I did some family practice residency and then started my own practice. And it was all based on hearing these people's stories getting the details, and then working with what I heard in the best way I knew how. Uh, this got refined uh, when I heard about nonviolent communication. This was partly through my wife's doing, who brought me to a workshop. And at that point, it became clear to me that, <clears throat> the, that similar to what they say in NVC, which is people's issues are based on or founded or grounded in them doing the best they can to meet their needs at the time. And I may have been the first one, or I don't know about that, to translate this into medicine and say that the symptoms we have, and even eventually the diseases we have, like high blood pressure or sinus and quote, infection, or whatever it is that you have, and I mean whatever it is that you have, were the equivalent, they were your body's uh, attempt to satisfy the situation or its needs in the best way it could, given the situation that it had. So I've been over this many times. High blood pressure comes when the movement of the blood is weak. And so the body responds by doing the best it can, which is to narrow the tubes to restore the flow. Now, we call that a disease, high blood pressure, and it does have negative repercussions. But it's really still the way to think of it is it's the best you can do at the time, given the fact that you have weak flow. If you don't want to clamp your uh, blood vessels, then you have to restore the flow and then the body will naturally open the vessels and the blood pressure will go away. The high blood pressure will go away. And that's exactly how I started to do medicine. I started to see everything as not specific diseases, but as individual stories and the reaction of the body to create the best situation it could, giving the situation you, you present it to. So if you keep injecting poisons into your body, you'll keep getting what we call colds or flus or pneumonia or bronchitis or sinusitis. None of that has anything to do with bacteria or virus. It has to do with your body's assessing the situation. We've put poison in, we have to get it out. The mechanism of getting it out is through creating mucus and cough and snot and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, we call that disease. And we treat the symptoms the actually the body's attempt to heal, and not the real problem, which is if you stop injecting poisons into you, you stop having to get stuff out of your body. And then the quote, infections or sinus trouble or coughing goes away. And so 
as time went on, uh, I refined this. I refined how I would get the story. I started the technique of telling people's story back so that they would know that I heard them, that they would have a chance to correct me. Uh, and I would get the story exactly right. And also to give the person the chance to hear their story uh, essentially translated to them from somebody else. And inevitably, they would either laugh, cry, or say, so you mean you think that uh, this si re repeated sinus thing, uh, quote, infection has to do with the fact that I injected poisons every year with my yearly flu shot and that the fact that I got sick two weeks later, you think those are related? And I would simply say, that's what you just told me. I'm just repeating it back to you. And then the people would get it and then they would change their ways because it was obvious what had gotten them into this situation, how they had put their body uh, into this situation where this was the best thing they could do. And so that uh, that was, again, essentially how I did medicine and I uh, continued to refine my technique. And as I've said uh, recently, the, the, the whole thing came down to, the thing being the practice of medicine, came to th uh, forgetting about diseases, whether it's Alzheimer's or ovarian cancer or sinus infection, but to hear the individual story, to hear what happened to the person, put that into a framework, tell the story back, and then have the experience and the knowledge and the expertise to say, given this story, here's how you would want to interface with this. If it's putting poisons in with injections, you stop doing the injections. But then you may have to uh, chelate or clear out the poisons that you already put in. If it's that your uh, uh, knee pain came after you did a year of a, say, vegan, i.e. no collagen diet, and then the tissues of your knee are breaking down, uh, and that's the story of this person, you uh, simply say, tell the person how to put back uh, nutritive collagen like bone broth back into their diet, and then you would see if the situation would resolve. And so the, my job essentially was first to hear the story, put the story into a kind of framework, and then have a wide enough repertoire so no matter what the person said, sometimes it was a trauma, sometimes it was an emotional traumatic experience. Uh, in fact, a lot of times there was a lot of trauma-based uh, emotional uh, pathology that you hear. There's a lot of nutritional deficiencies, people simply eating poor food and people poisoning themselves in a variety of ways, people not getting in the sun, people not connecting to the earth, people not moving properly, people having uh, family traumas. It could be all any number of things. And my job was to hear that story, hear it as an individual situation, and then know how the person could interface with that story or refer them to somebody who could help them with you know, emotional traumas or nutritional deficiencies, I didn't usually have to refer that, or to give somebody an herb or a homeopathic medicine or chlorine dioxide or an energy uh, solution uh, to, or sound healing or, an, or whatever it was to try to remediate that situation. As time went on, and largely thanks to my patients saying, you know, I tried low-dose naltrexone and that worked for this, and I tried chlorine dioxide and that worked for this, and I would hear that over and over again, and then I had enough sense to look into it. Not that I necessarily believe that it worked, but I would look into it. I heard people saying that tuning fork, biofield therapy uh, helped help them with this or that. So I would look into it, homeopathy, herbs, all kinds of things. Some things stuck and did seem to work. 
Some things didn't. And so then I discarded that. But my job was to have the experience to know, given this situation, what might work for you. And so we would try it out and give it a certain time frame. Like with if it was an acute situation, I might just give it an hour or a day. And if it was a, a less acute situation, I might give it a week or two weeks. People would report back. I would hear the story. And over time, you know, 30 years of doing this, you develop a repertoire or I developed a repertoire of what worked in what situation. And that became the way I did medicine. The only other thing that I'll say is along the way, uh, what was really crucial was the uh, the thing that I like to do the most, which was investigate the claims of modern medicine, modern science, and modern biology, and see which of them are actually true. And so I started this with looking at whether the heart actually pumps the blood, and whether vaccines are safe and effective, and whether cancer has anything to do with genetics. And then I went on, as everybody knows, to looking at the claims that viruses exist, which they don't, and whether we have an immune system. And then all of this got accelerated with reading Harold Hillman, and thanks to my friendship with uh, Stefan Lenka and many others who I don't even want to mention here, who really were able to uh, demonstrate to me and teach me that what things were real and what things aren't. And the whole edifice, the whole house of cards of modern medicine came crumbling down. And again, I was already prepared for that because the only thing that was left was the story and then various uh, techniques that have been developed often over hundreds, sometimes maybe even thousands of years uh, to remediate the ways that which people essentially make themselves or get themselves sick. So that became that that is essentially the philosophy of the new biology. The new biology uh, looks at the claims of the old biology. You know, we get sick, uh, we the genes control who we are, they control the proteins, that viruses and bacteria make us sick, that there's all these receptors on cell membranes, which we have to pay attention to, and sodium potassium pumps, and synapses in nerves that the dopamine crosses, or that I have serotonin receptors, all these things which turn out to be either irrelevant or don't even exist in the first place, you discard all that old biology, and again, you're left with this beautiful picture of what a living system is, which is essentially organized or coherent or sometimes called structured water with energy coming in and out, organizing the water to make the amazing living system, which is plants, animals, and all the people in the world. And you interface with that, find out the story of which part of the system went wrong for you, and uh, then you have a system of medicine. Uh, lately, meaning the last four or five years, I started to teach this to other doctors, uh, and this became the sort of seed for the practitioners who are now working in the new biology clinic. Some of some of them, I. Uh, mentor directly. Others have been listening to me and figuring this out on their own. There's nothing particularly unique about my figuring it out for myself. This can easily be figured out by any well-meaning person who just uh, opens the possibility to what's real. And so we started collecting these people, uh, these doctors and other practitioners into a kind of online in the beginning clinic setting. And that became the new biology clinic. And that's where we are today with four different doctors. Uh, there's uh, Adam who was trained as a anesthesiologist and pain specialist and Rodney who's a trained as a neurologist and Pam who's trained as a psychiatrist 
and Mark, who's trained as a family doctor in New Zealand. And then we have our uh, enrichment services or practitioners who do special things in addition to the general sort of medical staff. And that includes Pat, who does uh, primal movement. I'm not sure if that's what he calls it, but how to move in a healthy way. And just today, we added our second one, which is Tatiana, who is a trained as a chiropractor and who does things like uh, breath work and meditation and biofield tuning. And soon we're going to add Qigong practitioners and tapping to help with emotional freedom and whatever we can find that will actually help people. Now, I want to contrast this uh, with the specialist modern medical model that we're all so familiar with. In other words, the way the normal medical system works is you have a primary care doctor, a family doctor, and they do certain things, but if you have a real problem, you go to a specialist. So if you have a skin problem, you go to a dermatologist. And if you have a nervous system problem or MS or ALS, you go to a neurologist. If you need surgery for your gallbladder, they say you go to a surgeon. If you're uh, emotionally or psychologically not doing well, you go to a psychiatrist and so on. And I think the best way I can describe uh, the problem of this model is with an actual experience that I had with one of them. And mind you, I've had very few experiences with conventional medicine. Basically, the last time I went for a physical exam was to start my residency in 1984. And that was only because they made me in order to start. So essentially, haven't been back since, except for a few uh, small procedures. Um, I don't need to get into but <clears throat> so this was a story and I want to preface this by saying we we think and I would say think may not be the right word maybe the word is hope that when we go to a specialist um, and actually a friend of mine pointed this out and I thought it was a great way to phrase this and word this we hope for a certain level of sophistication from that specialist. And I think that's a great way to put it. In other words, you have a situation, you the patient, that this family doctor with all their training and experience can't handle. So they send you to a dermatologist because this is a difficult skin problem, right? So you expect a level of expertise and experience, and I think it's a great word, sophistication about skin problems. So here's the example. So this happened with uh, my son, Asher. Uh, I don't remember exactly how old he was, maybe 14 or 15 or so. And I think we uh, now think that it actually started after he, his uh, mother actually got him to get some vaccines, which I would have never done. But anyways, he did that. And then he's got this pretty bad rash on his hands. And so at some point, he asked me to take him to a dermatologist, which was fair enough. I mean, he wanted to see this was really interfering with his life and with his playing basketball. And uh, fair enough, he wanted to see a, uh, a real specialist in skin problems. So I, I warned him, and I remember this, that it may not be as rewarding as he thinks. But anyways, he wanted to go, and I could respect that. So I took him to this dermatologist in our town in New Hampshire where we lived. A nice gentleman. He was in his, I think, 50s, uh, seemed uh, very pleasant and all. And so we walk in the room, and I had made, I had made it clear that this was Asher's appointment, not mine. And so I was going to keep myself out of it. So we go in the room and he made some nice friendly comments. And uh, I think he knew that I was uh, also a local doctor. So he said, hello. And then eventually he says, so, uh, you know, Asher, what's up? And Asher said, I have a rash on my hands. And so the, the fellow says, oh, can I see? 
So Asher puts his hands up and he takes a look at his rash. Probably took him about 30 to 40 seconds. I said, oh, well, that's dishydrotic eczema. And then he turned around and went to his chair and he wrote out a prescription for a very strong steroid uh, cream. And he gave him a sheet for how to use this cream. And that was it. <laughs> and it took all of about maybe three to five minutes. Two of the th two to three of the minutes were writing out the prescription and giving him the form saying how to use it. And he expected that that would be it. So the entire history was, I have a rash. And the entire physical exam was looking at his hands. And I, my guess is many of you can relate to this story. So I think he expected us to leave at that point. But I said, uh, you know, I intervened, even though I said I wasn't going to. And I said, Asher, you, you had some questions about the relation of this rash to diet, right? And Asher said, yeah, you know, when I eat certain foods, I think maybe too much fruit, it seems to be worse. Do you have any, any, and you know anything about that or any thoughts about that? And the guy said, well, there's some people who say that a nickel allergy, nickel in food makes this rash worse. I don't know if that's true, but he looks in his drawer and he says, here's a diet that's low in nickel. So you could try that out along with the cream that you that we're giving you and see if that works. And that was truly it. Uh, Asher, I think, asked, is there anything else? And the guy said, no, there's nothing else. This is just, you know, genetic. That's how it goes. And don't, you know, the rat, this cream will work, but don't, you have to use it properly. Uh, and that's, that's the end of it. So that's, in a sense, our competitor. That's how they do medicine. And you can translate that to any situation, any neurologist, heart disease, uh, just about any encounter with conventional medicine specialists. That's what they do. They hear your story for about a minute or two or 30 seconds. They do their tests. They do their treatment based on the tests. And that's all. The level of sophistication of this encounter is about zero. So what do I mean by sophistication? One would expect or hope that this dermatologist has seen hundreds, maybe thousands of cases of skin rash, and that he has questioned these people intently. So he knows their habits, their diet, their stress level, whether they sleep well at night, whether there's toxic stuff in their living room, whether they've recently got any medicines or not, or vaccines, or what they're doing, or anything to do with their life that may impact whether they get this rash. The reality is in none of these specialists do they do any of this sort of thing. And frankly, I think it's fair to say they know absolutely nothing about any of these things. They only uh, look at it. They, the history means nothing to them. They make their diagnosis. They treat the diagnosis with what it says in the book. And that's the end of it. And one could even say, so what does a specialist do? So here's where it gets very interesting because that cream that Asher was given was a very potent steroid cream. And actually, the reality is that if you do use it, even in the way that's recommended, or God forbid, you should use it a little more, you will absolutely get significant adrenal suppression, and you will suffer other kinds of consequences. These are not side effects. These are direct, uh, predictable, natural, regular uh, effects of using that medicine. Not only that, you can 100% predict that if you use that medicine and it works, that if you ever stop using that medicine, it will come back worse than it ever had before, which is exactly what happened in this case and is exactly what happens in almost every case. So by going to a specialist, all you're doing, uh, as we said yesterday, 
is you get the quote strong stuff that the normal family doctors would say to themselves, oh, I'm not giving them that stuff because that's dangerous. Uh, so they give you Embrel for your quote rheumatoid arthritis and fluoridated steroid creams, which are extremely potent and cause eye changes and adrenal suppression and all kinds of other horrible effects. They're not side effects and on and on and on. So the normal doctors are afraid to give you those medicines or not quote qualified. And there's nothing about being a specialist that qualifies you to give you some, to give their patients strong, toxic, poisonous medicine, except that's just how it's done. It's not like being a dermatologist makes the effect of that steroid cream any less profound. That's obviously ridiculous. It still has the same horrible effects on every single person who's given that medicine. It will uh, cause other effects down the road in pretty much every single person who takes it, as does do all the medicines that the specialists are giving people. The other thing they do is they do procedures like heart catheterizations or sticking needles in people's joints to aspirate the fluid or doing biopsies of their skin or taking stuff off their skin, people's skin that the normal family doctors are not either trained or not willing to do. So that is the model in normal medicine. Now, you could say, so why do we have this array of specialists in our clinic? Um, because all of them are doing the new biology medicine based on the principles that I just outlined, a story-based individual uh, way of hearing a person's story, not so much worrying about the diagnosis, uh, not even worrying at all about the diagnosis, and just saying, how can they interface and make this person's life better right now? What in this story seems to need help? But the reason, the real reason for, quote, specialists uh, is not that to have somebody say you're only a nervous system or you're only a skin or you're only a heart, but to take this story-based approach and yet this person has heard a hundred or a thousand stories of people with memory loss or people with who are complaining of, say, depression or anxiety or pain or whatever it is. I've heard this a hundred times. I've questioned people a hundred times with a similar story. I know what might work. And that is an extremely valuable a resource. It's an extremely valuable skill because really what we're, we're offering, what a real doctor offers is while you may have seen one person or three people in your life with a rash, uh, hopefully we've seen a hundred. And so we have a, a wider range of experience of what kind of story might lead to this and what are the common threads of this story and what intervention might help. And so that's why we are essentially putting together this wide array of practitioners, first doctors, who have a wide range of experience so that any story you throw at us, we've heard that before, and we've heard these, this story, we've heard other people with similar stories, and we've learned through experience what might help and what uh, what we don't need to waste our time on. That essentially is the model. And I can say, as far as I can see, there is nobody who's doing it like this in the landscape of, of medicine or so-called healthcare that I know of. We're offering a very unique service here of a new biology, story-based, natural medicine approach to health that's based on making your life better right now. 
Now, the way that works, so that's this sort of philosophy, and let's get into some of the details. Uh, the details are, uh, we're, this is a, uh, and you can read all the details. We'll have a link to the website so you can sign up and get involved if you're so inclined. Uh, and so basically people pay a membership fee. And this membership, uh, with this membership fee, they choose one of our primary practitioners as their sort of primary doctor, primary uh, practitioner that they're involved in. And then they can essentially see this person as much as is needed. So we're not charging based on uh, single appointments, just because what I found in my uh, practice over the years is some people you need to check in every third day for a while. Uh, other people just every six months or every month or so. And it worked better to have people support us and know here's their budget for uh, being able to talk to these practitioners by uh, paying a monthly fee. And so we take the how often you can see the practitioner out of the financial equation. You see them and talk to them as much as is needed. So that's the first thing. Pay a monthly fee or your family does. You get access to the practitioner. And then we have what we're calling our enrichment services. And uh, these are the things that come along with your membership fee. And as time goes on, we're going to add more and more of these. But these are the things that uh, we're finding that I'm finding actually are skills or um, techniques, you might say, uh, but I think skills is a right word, uh, is a good word for it, that actually pe help people live healthier, fitter, stronger, more productive lives. And these come along with your membership fees. So the first one was Pat with helping people with movement and getting more stronger. Again, it's very simple. I we all or I learned that a lot of people's pain and back problems and knee problems was just they were weak and not moving properly. So everybody who's a member has access to the classes that Pat runs and I don't know the exact frequency or the schedule, but so you can have classes with a number of people in and he goes through these movements and helps you uh, figure out how to do the movements yourself. And then if you decide that this is something that you really need to be more involved in, you can make an individual appointment with, in this case, Pat, and that's obviously not covered by your re regular membership fee, but that is an option for our clinic members. So the group sessions are part of your membership. The individual sessions are on top of that. And then, as I said, we just added Tatiana uh, just this week, and she's offering uh, breath work, helps everybody. Guided meditation helps everybody. Biofield tuning in a group, which probably helps everybody. And then if you want to go further in this and schedule an individual session, that's obviously something on top of this, and you can do that. But again, everybody has access to these group sessions and we're finding in these, uh, all of these people, Pat, et cetera, have found that you can do a lot in a group. And soon we're going to add group Jigong and group uh, emotional freedom technique. And we're going to just keep adding practitioners with different forms of expertise, different types of uh, stories that people have that they keep hearing over and over again or as part of their particular quote specialty not that they're seeing you only as a nervous system or skin or psychiatric all of them story-based uh, food how you move what you think uh, all that stuff and all the different types of therapies, herbs, and homeopathy, and cell salts, and uh, whatever works. So that is the basic outline. We're even uh, hoping very soon to add a vet 
uh, which is something I'm very interested in. Uh, somebody who you can run your uh, beloved animal problems by, um, and whether it's a, an acute injury or an accident, and do I need to seek care or what's the best way to feed my dog, cat, or other animal for this particular situation, or just, again, a story-based what's happening in this animal's life. And as time goes on, as I said, we're going to keep adding more practitioners with more levels of expertise, different levels of expertise, and more of these enrichment services. So I think that pretty much covers it. Um, the only final thing I'll say is I was told that we have a $100 off for the activation fee. So when you sign up, there's a, a fee to activate your membership. And I'm not sure how long this, uh, this offering will go, but there's $100 off your activation fee, fee uh, right now. And the code is 100 OFF and OFF are in capital letters. That's 100 OFF. And I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, any of our customer service people are happy to help you sign up, give you more information. Um, we'll be putting out case studies and uh, what's happened with people and people's actual experience with our various practitioners and enrichment offerings. And it's all very exciting because for as far as I can see, this is not one of the futures of, of so-called healthcare, but this is the future of healthcare. And I am thrilled and honored to be part of it. So thanks everybody for listening and I will see you next week.